Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Algorithm Seminar. Uh, today our speaker is uh, Kiran Vodrohali. Um, Kiran is a fifth year PhD student at uh, Columbia University, uh, advised by Daniel Xu and uh, Alex Antoni, and a student researcher at Google Brain Research. Uh, he previously received a bachelor degree in mathematics and a master degree in computer science from Princeton University, uh, where he was advised by Sanjeev Arora. Uh, today, he is going to talk about the platform design problem. Um, please welcome our speaker. Thanks. So yeah, this is the platform design problem, and this is a joint work with Christos Papadimitriou and Mihailis Yanakakis. Um, okay, so basically, let's take a step back first and think about data collection in machine learning. So modern machine learning requires large amounts of high quality data. Uh, supervised methods are very popular uh, and very successful, but collecting supervised labels is very expensive. And uh, on the other hand, this is, this is kind of why unsupervised learning has sprung up in the past uh, decade or, or so. And this is, you know, more challenging to use. And it's what the data is inside, what's inside the data sets that you, uh, you look at, right? For instance, um, in these large language models, you often train like you know a huge internet corpus and so it's it has different challenges uh because it's not exactly clear what you can extract from it so this kind of poses another question which is is it possible to create environments which just kind of generate useful data naturally um so you kind of easing the collection difficulties of supervised learning um while maintaining some of the properties of unsupervised learning that you don't kind of have to go and specifically label things. So can you incentivize the creation of useful data? So one example of what I'm talking about is like, this is kind of a example that happened in reality, not intentionally per se, but on Reddit, right? Um, people often make sarcastic comments and they denote these sarcastic comments with a slash S tag. Uh, and this is like kind of implicit sarcastic. So this is kind of useful. Now, Reddit obviously didn't go and set out to create an environment such that these slash s tags would be created. But nevertheless, maybe this is kind of like a far reaching goal that we might want to support. Uh, so in some sense, you could, you, could, you could claim that modern tech companies are ultimately trying to solve a problem like this if they want to use like machine learning um, uh, downstream, right? OK. And, and this is indeed what a lot of companies essentially effectively do when they use data from the various platforms they create. OK, so that's the high level vignette. Um, so now let's, let's kind of talk about the economics of the online firm. So first, what I mean by an online firm is basically companies like Google, uh, Facebook, uh, and so on. And uh, basically what they do is they provide services to a bunch of users. Now, these online services, like, say, Google Search and Google Maps and so on, right, bring convenience and knowledge to the users. But the users don't necessarily pay directly for these services. Instead, the way the online firm profits is via revenue from the user data that's implicitly provided. Now, this can create profit in many ways. One is just better demand segmentation um, if they're trying to sell things, like Amazon. Uh, another is ad or like recommendation revenue, right? Which is, you know, Google and Facebook model. And then there's a third component, right? Which is, you know, if they want to improve their services, the, the data can also help them improve their services, which can then feed into, you know, their other uh, data gener I mean, revenue generating uh, mechanisms. So this is the basic problem we want to tackle. And we're going to study it theoretically. Uh, so first I'll give a concrete problem definition. Uh, simplification of this problem. And then we'll look at a general case. Uh, we'll see that it's hard computationally to solve. And we'll look at a tractable case. And we'll look at some extensions, summarize everything we talked about, and uh, talk about plenty of opportunities for future work. OK. So first, let's get a concrete, simple definition of a problem that we want to solve. So we call this problem platform design. So the key idea, right, is that Google is going to build, let's say Google, builds various uh, apps, like say maps, search, a social network, and so on, and then profits based on usage of these apps. 
Now, the usage of these apps, we're going we're gonna to model a user as living in a Markov chain that we're going to call life. Okay? And the user moves around this Markov chain between various activities, and uh, they're, they're also getting some reward. Uh, they, they don't necessarily get to choose any actions. They're just moving around. But now the creation, the, if Google apps or these platforms, um, this now provides an option for the user to opt in uh, at various states to these apps. So for instance, right, one can opt into using Google Maps while driving. And now this can modify the transitions of the markup chain. Uh, and you know, there's maybe some better reward associated with using an app, but maybe there's also some cost because the user is giving up some data. Okay, so now the, the user is basically solving an MDP, a Markov decision process. And so the, what the designer wants to do is the designer wants to, in a constrained way, uh, choose what this Markov decision process is to maximize their own rewards. So we're going to assume the designer has some linear reward function over the steady, dis steady state distribution of the agent's Markov chain. So the agent will assume is going to solve the Markov, sorry, the MDP. Uh, this is going to induce a steady state distribution, essentially, right? What's the percent of time the agent is spending in each platform? And then the designer is going to have some linear reward function over, uh, over this steady state distribution. And the designer wants to maximize their reward. So basically, we're modeling the revenue maximization problem of today's online firms as a bi-level MVP optimization problem. And the designer wants to indirectly optimize its reward via the agent's behavior. And this is basically you know, the question of finding the stackle equilibrium in this one round uh, Stackleberg game. So we're going to particularly look at the computational tractability of this question. So the Stackleberg game, again, is the designer moves first and adds various platforms which, if adopted, modify transitions to an existing Markov chain. That's the life chain. You can think of these platforms as basically uh, adding action at each. The agent is going to move second. They're going to get the MDP from the designer and then play the optimal behavior. And again, we just want to understand the computational complexity of solving for this equilibrium. So let's be a little bit more formal. Uh, so the agent is going to live in an irreducible Markov chain with n states. The designer is going to choose a subset of these states to add platforms to. And then get action is just adopt or don't adopt the platform at each state. And we're just going to always assume that the chain remains irreducible. OK. And then we're going to call the utility rates for the agent the, in terms of variable ci. And for the designer, they will be di. Okay for each state. And we're going to call the resulting steady state probabilities of the of an agent's optimal solution by pi. And then the designer is going to optimize over the set S. It's just the you know, linear rewards uh, with respect to the steady states, uh, assuming that uh, design, the, the Markov chain, the MDP faced by the agent is given by S. And that there's going to be some one-time costs for building the platforms that are chosen to be built. Okay. So let's look at the general case of this problem first. Okay. So this is the situation, right? We have the agent. They have various activities they can be doing, like watching movies, eating lunch, driving, shopping, exercising, studying, reading the news. And then the online firm comes along and asks, what platforms should I build? Okay. So remember, at a cost, the firm can add an action to a platform that they create. So for instance, they could create Google Maps. Okay. So let's say the agent. So let's say they create uh, Google Maps. And now the agent decides to opt into Maps. This can change the transitions, right? So for instance, you know, Google Maps uh, affects, it Im improves your capability of doing other things when you're driving, right? If you have Google Maps on, maybe it's a lot easier to find a restaurant that you want to eat at. So you eat lunch more lunch now after you started driving. Or maybe you're able to quickly find a movie theater, or maybe you find a gym, right? 
So that's one kind of change. The other change is uh, another 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 kind of change. So let's say you're shopping, right? You're browsing, uh, and you're looking for a store, right? And so Google Maps now tells you how to drive to this store, right? Uh, so now this there's an increase in the transition probability from looking for a store to going to driving to actually go buy the thing in person. So this is an example. And it turns out that this is strongly NP hard. Uh, so it's strongly NP hard to decide whether the designer can obtain a positive profit. Of course, it's also hard to approximate. Um, the reduction is just from set cover. And the idea is kind of uh, the agent has a bunch of problems that they really need to solve. And if they can't solve these problems, um, then they are going to be completely unproductive. They're going to go to an unproductive state, which is low reward, which is also hard to escape. OK? Uh, on the other hand, uh, if the agent's problems can all be solved by, say, platforms, uh, then, then they will be able to stay in like a good reward. OK? And it has to be the case that all of them are solved. So now this basically means that the designer's problem is to come up with a platform for each which can solve a subset of the problems such that overall you have like a minimum cost. This is very similar sounding now to set cover. Uh, and the most cost of effective covering set is a NP hard problem. So in economic terms, we can think of this as exploiting the complexity of complementary goods. Uh, so as a concrete example, like I mentioned before, you might have a brick and mortar retail ad on, on a website, right, via Google search. And on the other hand, Google Maps helps the agent get to the store. So they're kind of working in conjunction to solve two different problems. Okay, And uh, the utility of both kind of is you need both of these things for, for you to get the total value. OK. So OK, so that's hard to approximate even. So let's see if we can come up with a more tractable case. So we're going to call this case the flower case. So you can see it looks like a flower. Uh, so we're imposing some restrictions on what the, the MVP looks like. Okay. So basically, petals, right? These uh, nodes at the edges. These are the end states of the platform. And uh, this is a transitory state in the middle. Think of it as a rest state. Okay. So basically, uh, right? You know, you can you you, you rest. You tr you transit to some state of the flower. There's some probability you stay there, then you go back to the rest, you go to another state, et cetera, OK? Uh, so now the platform designer gets to make the following tweaks only to the platform. Basically, they can add some YI uh, probability to the uh, self-transition probability of each node. And this, of course, also affects the transition to the rest state. Um, and they can do that for any number of the, the nodes here, right? each of them but constitute individually a platform. Okay. And this why I can be positive or negative, but just, uh, yeah. OK. So this is a restricted yeah. So that this problem can be solved by a fully polynomial time approximation scheme. And so let's get some intuition as to why this is more tractable. So first of all, in economic terms, this kind of corresponds to a substitutes case rather than a complements case, because we're more trying to decide how to allocate the time spent in each platform. Um, and uh, you know, we have to cannibalize time in one platform to optimize time in another platform. That's the nature of modifying the position loops. Right. So, and then some more uh, technical reasons uh, one reason is that the agent behavior, so, so in general, right, an MDP can be solved with a linear program or something like value iteration, right, dynamic programming methods. Um, it turns out that for this MDP, uh, there's a simple algorithm for the agent, which is just a greedy algorithm. And so this makes it easier to uh, manipulate, okay, by the platform design and easier to analyze. And so in the end, it's going, we're going to get a dynamic program after we discretize some, pro, some aspects of the problem, which is kind of based off the same ideas as the classic knapsack dynamic program. Okay. So let's first characterize the way the agent behaves. So basically, first, what you can go ahead and do is solve for the steady state distribution um, given some choice of platforms. So for the flower MDP, it turns out that this is 
a closed form solution, which looks like a quasi concave combinatorial optimization problem, which I've written right here. So there's a lot of terms here, but the, the, main, the, main, the main thing is you should think of this term here, right, as basically the utility of the agent, right? So S is a subset of the end states where you build the platforms. Um, these phi of J's are going to be this potential function right here, okay? And uh, these ZJs are kind of, um, the, they're, they're basically looking at kind of the steady state uh, percentage times if you have the yi versus if you don't have the yi. Okay. Here I have a thing that says greater than or equal to zero. This is just for one case. We can actually let this be negative also. It's just a slightly more complicated analysis. And then these are some constants, a and b, which depend on the parameters of the problem. Okay. And then remember, the ci's are the agent rewards. Okay. So it's going to turn out that this potential function is going to give us a greedy algorithm um, for the agent. In particular, this is the greedy algorithm. We just take that potential function, sort it from largest to smallest, and while the utility of the agent given S is uh, less than the potential at K, uh, you add K. And then after, so it's a relatively simple proof. Uh, basically, it's an application of the median inequality. It's classic uh, simple inequality right here. Uh, basically, what we do is we want to analyze. Uh, we want to analyze what uh, the conditions on the optimal policy. So, in particular, the condition that's useful to look at is that the optimal policy must be prefix. So it must contain the first m states sorting by some potential function phi, and you can prove this by you know using greedy swap arguments. Uh, the proof and algorithm are slightly more complex when the zi. Uh, the differential term there is negative, but it's not too different. Um, yeah, one way of thinking about the potential is basically that it's like the platform reward plus some scaled gain over the regular life, and the agent accepts either when you know the base platform reward is just high, or when the amount of the platform is high and the platform is at least like a certain amount better. So that's like kind of the intuition. So now. Given that we know the agent's behavior, um, what does the designer's algorithm look like? So let's recap what the designer objective looks like. And we have the set of states S, profit. We have the steady state rewards for the designer DI. We have the steady state probabilities pi I. And we have the one-time costs for building each platform. Okay, So the designer wants to optimize this over S. So we can rewrite this expanding the profit function given the agent behavior. Uh, and we see that we get an objective for the profit that looks like this. And um, just for shorthand notation, in a, in a few future slides, the, I'm going to talk about the whole first term of this profit, right? Basically, the profit, but not considering the costs. And then this D of S is going to be the denominator term, OK? And then note this denominator term is also exactly the same as the denominator term in the agent reward. Okay, so these are these are going to be the useful quantities that we are going to use in our dynamic program. We're also going to define the maximum di to be k, and therefore the maximum profit is at most n times k. And we also are going to make some important assumptions on the zi, namely that they are polynomial in n and they are discretized with some gap delta. And we're also going to assume that similarly the costs are scaled as polynomials in n times this maximum di. So these bounds are going to be necessary. All right. So first, uh, you know, we have to figure out what we should even try to shoot for. So it turns out that what is possible to attain a certain profit is NP complete, you know, reduction from partition. So our goal is just an approximate algorithm in polynomial time. So we can come up with the following dynamic program for the FP test. So the key idea is that we're going to use a polynomially sized hash table. And we're going to round the rewards appropriately um, in a manner very similar to the standard knapsack uh, FP test uh, by Ibarra and Kim. So 
yeah, basically the main difficulty comes from the scaling the profit and also in the original problem if the ZI are not discretized. So we kind of get rid of the second problem by assuming it away, right? We're assuming that they are discretized uh, as factors of this small delta. Uh, it may be possible to do something else without this approach. Uh, it may be possible to come up with a different approach where you don't have to discretize the ZI, but we kind of suspect it is necessary. Uh, and for this approach, certainly we need to discretize the ZI. Uh, so basically, yeah, we could just come up with this hash function, which looks at uh, the three important things. One is the whole profit, and we're going to scale accordingly. This is like exactly the same scaling that you use in the knapsack FP test, essentially. Uh, except in the knapsack FP test, the hash is just one term, whereas here we have three terms. One for the full profit, one for the P1 term. This is, again, the profit without the cost and one for the denominator, which is just, uh, we just look at the multiples. And this is like, you know, polynomially bounded because we assumed that. Okay. So then the actual dynamic program is we maintain this hash, hash table and uh, we iterate through the sets in lexicographic order. And one thing that's important to note is that it's efficient to check feasibility for an agent because we can just run, simulate the agent as a, uh, you know, near linear time uh, protocol to decide whether they accept or not, right? That's the agent that greedy algorithm we saw before. So that's, so we can always do that. And the idea, the key idea, right, is, you know, we, we decide when to update the hash table, right? So we update if the numerator of the agent reward for some new uh, set S prime, right? Some new set of platforms S prime is smaller than the current hash. That's the key idea, that's, that's it. So then we just build this hash table, right? Um, and then we just iterate over all the sets in the hash table and we return the one with the largest uh, profit. Not, well, you know, approximate profit. Okay. And then this is going to end up being polynomial time because the size of the hash table is gonna be polynomial time and our checks are all uh, polynomial. So let's do an outline of the proof. So, you know, it's, it's a relatively standard proof. Um, basically, there's a, there's a key lemma, right, that we need to prove. So for two sets, uh, subsets of the states where we build platforms that hash to the same bin, if the numerator uh, is smaller, if the numerator of S is smaller than S prime, then for any postfix set T, so postfix set meaning you know, we, we've gone up to, like, we've looked at uh, the, the states 1 through k. So now we consider any set t from k plus 1 to n, okay? Uh, so first we have a feasibility guarantee for our s if the, if the numerator is smaller. And second, we have an approximation guarantee. Uh, we know that s union t, s union the postfix, is at most epsilon k over n worse than so the proof of this feasibility condition is just the fact that since they hash to the same bin, they have the same denominator. Um, that's, that's what we get from the third term in the hash table. And then we also just look at the suboptimality of S union T, and then that, that immediately yields feasibility. For suboptimality, we have this uh, nice relationship, which you can get by just expanding out the functions and doing a little simplification. Um, the difference in profits between S union T and S prime union T is bounded by just the difference of profits of S and S prime and the difference in the P1 term of S and prime, the sum of these two things. Um, and then using the fact that they map to the same hash bin uh, gives us uh, this epsilon K over 2N approximation and just adding the two gives us what we want. So it's relatively simple. And was apply this key lemma using induction and yeah so you assume after the i iteration that uh, the hash table contains an s extendable to an s union t or t is again the postfix so that it's at most epsilon i k over n suboptimal then after n iterations we're going to get our one minus epsilon factor and basically the inductive step is just to apply the key lemma at step i so if you, there's two cases either s is replaced in which case you add on an extra uh, 
term of epsilon k over n, and you, you get the desired guarantee. Otherwise, it's actually even a tighter bound, and there's no degradation. So it's a rel relatively simple argument. Okay. And then, you know, then the complexity is easy. Uh, it's n log n to check feasibility. The denominator dimension is size n over delta. And then the profit dimensions are each size n squared over epsilon times polynomial factor for the costs. And therefore, the overall size of the hash table is polynomial. So now we're going to talk about some extensions, because this was just the basic setting with one designer and one agent. So we can also consider the case where there's multiple agents, and we just replace the designer objective with a sum over the agents. Uh, right, so this is the sum over the agents. Agents I, and then the Js are the platforms. And each agent is doing their own thing, and then there's still just a one-time cost to build these platforms. So in this setting, there's an exact polynomial time uh, dynamic program. If the number of agents constant, and we also require the potentials now to be discretized by some delta prime with polynomial size. So previously in the FB test, right, the whole the whole trick was that we weren't going to put any bounds on the potential surrounding thing. So if we require the potentials to be discretized, now it turns out we can get an exact algorithm although it's exponential in the number of agents. And this, it turns out, is kind of necessary to assume because there is no FP task for two agents if the, uh, if the potentials are not polynomial size. So we kind of need this bound now. And uh, the idea is, is basically this discretization ideas again. And uh, this time we're going to discretize over both the potentials and the denominators. And then we will look at each potential denominator pair and we, we can compute an optimal subset uh, such that the potentials are at least uh, delta, uh, sorry, at least theta with the DP hash table. The size of this hash table is going to be um, uh, m to the 3k, where m is just the number of discretized numerators and denominators. Uh, the reason why there's a 3 there is because you have m which correspond to the numerators, which look like um, zi's times potentials. So there's uh, m of each of those, so m squared. And then you also have m corresponding to just the denominator, z. So if you want to get all pairings, uh, you need to look at m cubed. And then k is the number of agents, so we're going to maintain this thing for every single agent. And that's where the exponential part comes from. And then, you know, we just are going to enumerate over uh, theta and d. And the point is that we are going to be able to exactly compute values for each entry in this hash table uh, efficiently. And the analysis is, you know, it's relatively standard, but it's a little bit messy. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, so then the, another setting we can consider is the designer competition setting, where we now have designers, right? So you have an online firm and you have a competing firm. Uh, the comp uh, social work before Google built a uh, Google Plus or something. So what what should what should Google now do, given that there's already these transitions out there, and or, sorry, there's all, already these platform options out there for the agent. Okay. Right. So what if other competing designers have already built platforms? So we're going to assume for simplicity that each platform affects only one state. There's at most one platform for each designer per state. So there's two questions now. One is first, we have to revisit how an agent behaves in this setting, because it's going to be slightly different. And then secondly, we're going to again investigate the question of the designer optimally placing platforms. So it turns out that the agent still has a greedy algorithm in this setting, but the potential function changes now. So we're following this uh, function rho of platforms j and j prime at the same state. So fix the state. Now there's you know Google's platform j and Facebook's platform j prime, right? So we're going to define this uh, kind of slope uh, between uh, the two platforms, where again the z's are the denominator terms and the phi's are the old potential terms. And the one way you can think of this is you can think of this as a swap potential. So right, essentially, you know, if you look at this term in the numerator, just in the numerator, right? Is, oops, sorry. 
This is exactly what you would uh, add to the numerator of the overall objective. If you were going to remove platform j at the state s and replace it with j prime. And then similarly, this is exactly what would happen in the denominator as well, but separately. But nevertheless, like looking at this ratio, right, we're going to be able to use things like the median to quality and similar analysis that we did before. Uh, so this ends up being a very natural term to consider. Right. So uh, in particular, uh, they also, it also has this nice structure. Uh, if we plot the ZJs against the ZJs times the old potentials, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll get this uh, conv concave curve, okay, where uh, the row is going to correspond to the slopes between these points. These points are going to be actually also decreasing in the old potential phi as well. And below all these points, so if we associate, you know, each, uh, each platform j with a certain point here, right, uh, we, we can immediately kind of see that all the points below this curve are not relevant and we're never going to use them because we can always just increase uh, this zj phi j term, which is desirable uh, by moving up along. So it turns out that the, the points on the, on the edge of it are the only ones we will ever want to consider. And basically, the pretty algorithm for the Asia now is going to be almost the same as before, except now uh, we will consider swapping, uh, swapping platforms uh, as we move along this point. So let me be a bit more clear. The new potential is this um, other function where we're going to we're going to look at l as kind of the index uh, along here right so this is like l equals 1 this is l equals 2 l equals 3 l equals 4 l equals 5 etc and so if l, l equals 1 we just use the old potential now if l is greater than 1 we're going to instead replace it with this kind of swap potential right and this is again just corresponding to the sw to the slope so this is this this the first slope is this slope and the second one is this slope and well, Basically, the algorithm now amounts to just checking if you also if you want to swap, and you just look at this, these slopes and compare them to the utility so far, and you do this until um, the slope is no longer uh, adding the slope is no longer improving on the utility. So there's some you know details to prove all these things, but that's the basic intuition. Yeah. So again, it's algorithm. You also have the opportunity to swap. Okay. And this is also an efficient algorithm because you, basically it's just a linear scan required to find these red points, which are the only relevant points. And that's the term n. And the rest is just m log m as, as usual. Okay. So now the question is, is there an efficient designer algorithm? And it turns out algorithm also essentially works in the multi-platform setting, where again, we're making the same assumption about the potentials and the denominators. Um, so since again, we make this assumption on the polynomial, like, you know, the polynomial bounded potentials and the discretization of the potentials, we can also get an exact algorithm again, which is again, polynomial time when the number of agents is constant, but exponential when it's in, in the number of agents. And basically, the same algorithm goes through. We just have to modify the hash function to take into account the numerator and the denominator of the swap potential now as well. Okay. So I'm going to summarize. So platform design, the point was to model the economic activity of online firms. The general case of platform design is strongly NP-complete, hard to approximate. Uh, but there is a tractable special case called the flower MDP. It has a greedy algorithm. Um, and there is a knapstack style dynamic program polynomial time approximation scheme for the designer with unbounded potentials. And under polynomial discretized potentials, there's also an exact dynamic program for K agents. Um, and similarly for multiple platforms. And there are going to be many open directions. So. That's what we'll talk about now, future work. So some immediate questions that arise are uh, the designer versus another designer setting. 
So what we did now, right, was we kind of assumed that one designer got there first, and then the second designer just has to react to the first designer. Um, so what we can ask, you know, we can ask uh, about a simultaneous version of this game, and we can ask about the complexity of finding pure Nash equilibrium. We can also think about repeated game settings between designers and designers. Uh, this particular kind of succinct game. Then, of course, um, there are many questions on the agent side here, right, um, relating to privacy and fairness. Uh, so far, we've kind of modeled the privacy aspect of the agent via the agent's shift in um, reward, right? So if the agent, if the agent takes on a new, uh, accepts a platform, right, then we're just letting the agent's reward in that accepted platform state kind of model both the utility of getting the uh, of getting access to the platform as well as maybe whatever negative sides come up uh, with the agent giving up their data let's say right but uh, we could we could there's probably many other ways we could try to model this question and um, dig deeper right and then similarly regarding fairness uh, questions right should some agents be able to profit more than others how do we make it equitable for all agents to be able to use the platforms equally another kind question that we could ask is, are there other classes of tractable MDPs which correspond to interesting real-world settings? So we have the flower MDP, right, which corresponds to uh, the substitute goods sort of setting, right? But maybe there are other assumptions we can make which, make which still result in at least some notion of tractability. And it would also be nice to get uh, results for generic classes of agent behavior. So instead of maybe specifying a particular MDP, maybe we could instead make some assumptions about the agent behavior in broad strokes and uh, give guarantees for the optimization over uh, the bi-level uh, control of such agents. And one thing worth noting here is that a lot of these questions are problems of just formulation, right? They're not necessarily technical questions. Um, immediate. They're not immediately technical questions necessarily. Okay. Uh, there's also one thing that's glaringly absent from our setup: learning. So we have kind of assumed that everybody knows everything uh, in our setting, right? The designer knows all the rewards of the agent. The agent knows all the rewards of the designer, and they kind of just uh, behave, and we just investigate it computationally. So what if both of them, one of them or both of them, have to learn? So one, one kind of simplest question that we could ask is, uh, we, could, we could instead imagine that uh, we get a distribution of agent types. We get access to some distribution of agent types, and we just want to get the expected reward over this distribution. So this is basically a ERM problem with this quasi-linear function class. And, um, we can solve ERM efficiently if the finite support is constant with the discretized polynomially bounded potentials. This is basically the multi-agent setting, right? But if the support isn't constant, if it's continuous, as might, we might expect, right, in a more learning setting, right? It's, it's not likely that we would have nailed down the rewards for, like, say, three types of agents only, right? Then the uh, via our ERM via our algorithm is no longer computationally efficient because you know it's exponential in the size of the support, right? So we can ask: Are there other approaches? And under what conditions is computationally efficient learning possible in this setting? And the goal would be to beat uh, you know exponential in uh, the size of the support uh, algorithms here. So you know we, we haven't ruled out uh, we haven't ruled out anything about whether the exponential in the number of agents is necessary or not uh, under our assumptions of um, you know, polynomially bounded potentials and so on, right? This is just one algorithm, so maybe there are better algorithms. Okay, another kind of question we could ask is think of the designer as a bandit, okay? Which, as in particular, a combinatorial bandit. So basically what they're doing in, in our current setup of the problem is they're playing some combinatorial set S every round. And then they get some reward based on the results of the MDP. So now this differs from existing works in the combinatorial bandit literature because there are both complicated dependencies between the arms, right? They're not just IID rewards from each arm. And uh, secondly, 
the, the, the other, or sorry, independent rewards, I should say. And this other issue, right, is that the rewards are also nonlinear, right? Uh, so these are two individually common assumptions, uh, which are used to simplify the problem. Uh, but here we have both of them at the same time. So this makes it an interesting question to resolve. Uh, we could also ask questions about repeated game variants of the problem where both the agent and the designer are learners. Um, we could ask about other notions of equilibrium which are computationally tractable in this setting, right? Uh, like, say, both the agent and the designer play some uh, algorithm. Uh, is it computationally tractable to find a, uh, you know, correlated equilibrium and things like this uh, for for this for the for the description of in terms of the description size. Uh, and we can also ask questions about strategic agents, right? And as I alluded to before, designer designer competition. So uh, yeah. Another direction is to look at abstracting the designer rewards uh, more carefully. So so far in, in our in our current setup, right? We kind of so there's a connection right to the whole question of getting agents to generate data that I mentioned in the very beginning. Right, uh, but the way we modeled it in this problem is basically just the as some reward function associated with the agent spending time in each state, and we didn't kind of specifically uh, ask about a problem, a learning problem, say that the designer is going to use the data for, uh, or and we didn't also explicitly model uh, agents emitting data. So one thing, another another direction we could go is to look at this kind of question: Are there specific models here which are interesting? Uh, and this is also connected with data valuation problems, of course. And this is kind of getting back to one of the motivating questions I said at the very beginning as well. All right. And then I'll have like one last slide kind of describing a grand vision for this kind of uh, research agenda. So, yeah, basically the idea is we want one, one question we want to do is we want to be able to design environments which generate useful and sample old data, which I was mentioning just in the previous slide. Another question is, you know, we want to build up better models of the economics of companies, which are dependent on the information economy. Um, and similarly, model the strategic behavior of online firms and their users, because this is now you know, very socially relevant uh, in the modern age. Um, and then there's also kind of some orthogonal directions, which are a little bit related as well. So one of these is, you know, uh, we could also take the perspective of looking at reinforcement learning, right? Um, and say, say, you know, like what we what we are studying in this in this paper, what was this sort of this bi-level environment design, right? But one thing it's highlighting is kind of is the uh, central importance of the environment itself. Uh, so one could imagine, like, you know, coming up with a better sequence of uh, environments in a meta reinforcement learning problem to enable more efficient uh, generalization across environments for algorithms. And the other question, which is also kind of related, is um, to the manipulation of learning agents, right? Um, so, you know, in this case, the agent wasn't a learning agent, it was just an MD. Right? We can ask more general questions about, is it possible to like, say, manipulate an online learner? There is there is some existing work in this direction already. And uh, basically we could ask, uh, you know, we can go down that route even further. All right, yeah, thank you.